with you this morning. Uh, Emily had double duty yesterday giving two talks, and so today is my turn for two talks. I'm very glad to be with you. I'm sorry we have to close the curtains because of the excitement of the Suez Canal going by, but uh, we'll, we'll do this for an hour, and then this afternoon I will be back. Um, what we're trying to do now, uh, Emily and I both started our first lectures with fairly general topics. Um, two days ago, I'm sure I overwhelmed you with trying to give you a 50-minute you know, survey of all the faith and culture of the ancient Near East. Now we're going to get into more details. Yesterday, of course, Emily talked about the uh, religion and art of ancient Egypt. I had, I had some people asking me questions about Egypt. I do not profess any particular knowledge about Egypt. If you want to know about that, the religion, for instance, <coughs> uh, Emily quite literally, as I said before, wrote the book. Her book on the ancient religious uh, religions of Egypt is wonderful. I have a copy of it on my Kindle. And so if you're interested, she can answer all of your questions. My particular uh, expertise is in world religions and development of historical culture and religion. So today I'm going to be talking to you about the mysteries of the Nabataeans. This is in preparation for our visit to the city of Petra. Um, to, tomorrow we stop at Hurghada for uh, an opportunity to visit the Egyptian desert. The day after that, we stop in uh, Akba at the north end of the Gulf of Akba to visit the city of Petra. So we're giving you um, a preview of that today so you can understand what it is you're going to experience and be able to appreciate it more when you actually see it. This afternoon, I will be talking to you. Uh, my talk will be called Alone in the Desert. It is about Christian monasticism, which began in the Egyptian desert. And then particularly we will talk about St. Catherine's Monastery, which we will be visiting on the following day when we stop at Sharm el Chief. Um, <coughs> subsequent to that, um, Emily will do another talk about Egypt prior to our visit to Luxor, the Valley of the Kings. Um, and then we'll have other talks as we go along. In fact, for me, and I'm sorry I don't have um, Emily's talks up here today, Mystery of the Nabataeans and Petra, this afternoon, Alone in the Desert, Christian Monasticism in the Middle East, and then my subsequent talks, this is after we come back from Luxor, and unfortunately for those of you who are uh, from Luxor or going back to Cairo, you won't hear these live. Moses, the Israelites, and the Exodus crossing the Red Sea. We'll be talking about that. And then a number of other topics we'll pick up. You will notice uh, my lovely wife Carolyn is videotaping uh, my lectures as well as Emily's. We will have those available online once we get back. This afternoon, and then I'll talk to Marius about maybe getting it put in the bulletin as well. We'll give you that website. So that once you get back home, you if you missed any of the talks, you'll be able to go on and pick them up via video. Okay? Well, let's get started with our talk about the Nabataean people, an ancient people who no longer exist, and the city of Petra. But before we get into all of that, I want to start in the middle. And I want to start with a man, a man named Johann Ludwig Burkhardt. He was Swiss. He actually you know, in Switzerland, they have several languages. He had an English version of his name. He called himself John Louis uh, Burkhardt, or sometimes called himself Jean-Louis Burkhardt. He was one of the very first of the great 19th century explorers. The 19th century was when all of these people, like David Livingstone, you know, you know Dr. Livingstone, I, I presume, were exploring Africa. Africa was still the dark continent. Well, as a, a young Swiss man, he developed a fascination with Africa. And uh, he was born in 1784. In 1806, when he was still in his early 20s, he went to England and proposed to an organization that was there at that time, which was called the African Association, that they sponsor him in an effort to go to Africa and to discover the source of the Niger River. A lot of what they were doing back then was trying to find out where these major rivers, the Nile, the Niger, and others, started. So he appealed. They agreed to fund him on an expedition, which was to start in 1809, for him to go to Africa and discover the source of the Nile. But in order to do that, a lot of the areas he was going to have to travel in were Islamic. And so he decided he needed to toughen himself up and he needed to learn Arabic and also needed to learn everything he could about the Islamic culture. He studied Arabic first at Cambridge University, and then he traveled to the Middle East. He stopped off in the island of Malta on the way, and in Malta he heard about this mythical city that was called Petra. And Petra had not been seen or heard of by anyone in the West for over 500 years. It had been at the very end of the Crusades, the last time anybody knew about it, and so it had become almost a legend. 
Well, he had heard about it and thought that was interesting. He then traveled on to Aleppo in Syria, where he studied very intensely for two years to learn Arabic and became so fluid, fluent in Arabic and so well, um, you know, well trained in Islamic law that he actually convinced the people that he met after that that he was Islamic. In fact, he went by the name Sheikh Ibrahim Ibn Abdallah. And people, his Arabic was so fluent, they did not know that he wasn't actually Islamic. Well, from Aleppo, he began to travel around after he learned uh, Arabic and had really developed his expertise in Islamic law. He began to travel around throughout Syria, Lebanon, and as he was on his way down to Cairo, Egypt, he heard some of the local Islamic Bedouin merchants talking about this stone city that was hidden. And he thought that sounded fascinating. Well, he understood that nearby this stone mythical, supposedly mythical city, there was the tomb, purportedly, the tomb of Aaron, the brother of Moses, who had died as they were traveling to the Promised Land and had been buried nearby. And so he convinced these local Bedouins to take him there so that he could sacrifice to, at the tomb of Aaron. They took him there and in 1812, he became the first Westerner in 500 years to see the fabled city of Petra, which you're going to get to see in two days, all right? Um, now, when he visited Petra, as I say, he was the first one to see it. He was frightened because this was so extraordinary. He was afraid if they find out that I'm really not uh, who I claim to be, that I'm liable to suffer the consequences. So he was only there for a short visit. But in 1822, 10 years after his actual visit, he managed to get reports back to England about the city of Petra. Immediately, people in England and in continental Europe became fascinated with this. They started visiting by camel. At that point, it became clear to the people in that area that rather than be frightened of Westerners, there was an income that was going to be made by this, that they were so interested and they were willing to pay for guides and to pay for accommodations. Uh, today, right outside Petra, you will find you know hotels and there's swimming pools and there's all sorts of things, as there is by uh, the monastery in, in Sinai as well. So from that first visit in 1812, and then the first report that he sent back in 1822, people began to discover the beauty, the amazing uh, city of Petra. Now, there's always been a fascination with any hidden or uh, supposedly mythical cities. Petra has been one of the extreme examples of that. Today, Petra is one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. Uh, after having been lost for five centuries, there are digs that are going on now. In fact, the gentleman that's here who said that his uncle was responsible for finding um, one of the, the churches, because I'll talk in a minute about the religion there. Um, it went through a long period of, of transition, including having Greek influence, Roman influence, and even a Byzantine church that was there. And uh, one of the gentlemen on board, he said his uncle was responsible for finding the mosaics, which I'll show you a picture of in a few minutes here. Um, well, Burkhart ended up traveling up the Nile, he actually discovered the tomb of Ramses as well, so he was responsible for some other things, but he died at age 32 of dysentery in Cairo. He never did find the Nile River, but we do thank him for having discovered, or rediscovered rather, the, the Rose Red Sea, as it's sometimes called. Now, you get a little bit of an idea of the scale here. This is a man standing on one of the pedestals of one of the tombs that we will see there. Now, um, understand that Petra was not on any maps at the time that Burkhardt discovered it. it. There was no one who knew about this city in the West. It was only a rumor. It was only a legend. Things like Angkor Wat in Cambodia and other places that had been legends for centuries and people thought probably wasn't really true. Well, they discovered that it really was true. This is a very early art print which was done of it. Uh, the name Petra is Greek. It means rock. And if you know your New Testament, Peter got named Peter by Jesus, uh, which literally means he named him the rock, and he said, on this rock I will build my church. So Petra means rock. It probably is the same city that's referred to in the Bible as Sela, S-E-L-A. Um, 
the reason especially that people have been interested in this city for so long is it is in the Holy Land. This is considered part of the Holy Land, holy not only to the Jews and to the Christians, but to Islam as well. And so it's been a focal point for that reason. Um, in 2007, it was named a uh, World Heritage Center, and in, um, it's also been named one of the new seven wonders of the world. So it is quite extraordinary that we're going to be able to visit this thing. Um, let me talk for a few minutes now about who the Nabataeans were, the people that were responsible for building this city. The Nabataeans really are something of a mystery to us. We're not exactly sure where they came from, and they don't exist anymore, so it's not like we can ask them. Um, one theory is that they may have been descendants of Nabioth, who was the oldest son of Ishmael, Ishmael being the oldest son of Abraham. Abraham had two sons, Ishmael by the servant um, Hagar, and then Isaac, the one we know more about, who was the son of Sarah. But the legend is that Ishmael's oldest son, Nabioth, may have been the ancestor of all the Nabataean people. Another suggestion has been made that they may have come from ancient Babylonia, because Aramean is the region, the Arameans were descended from the Babylonians, and at one time in Arabic, Ar the, the word for Aramean was Nabataean. They, those words were interchangeable. But the strongest likelihood is that this group of people came from southern Arabia. They were a nomadic people. They traveled, they made their living by trade, initially probably by robbing caravans, camel caravans, and later on became great traders. Um, they settled in this area. Now initially, the uh, merchant Nabataeans were, as I say, nomadic. They didn't settle down. They didn't. They actually did not apparently believe in settling down because they thought if they did, they would end up being subject to another people who would be more powerful. Now, this is a map. I think I used this map the other day in talking about faith and culture in the in the ancient Near East um, of the kingdoms of Judah in the south and Israel in the north when the nation of Israel was split in two after Solomon. Well, you will notice the Nabatu tribes. These were the nomadic Arabic tribes, and this was the area they lived in. Now, the interesting thing here is you'll notice this is Petra. It's not in the area of the Nabatu tribes. At that time, and this was about 1000 BC, Petra was actually in the kingdom of Edom. Well, in 586, the Babylonians destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah uh, and carried them off into captivity. When that happened, the Edomites moved north into the better pasture lands that had been part of Judah. And when they did, they sort of vacated this area down here, and the Nabataeans moved in. You will notice that whereas right here, the Nabatu, this is the border, the northern border. It's sort of parallel to the southern end of the Dead Sea. As you went along, their border's up here on the north side of the Dead Sea. And that's the Nabatean peoples. The longer they went, the further north they went. And eventually, they ended up controlling land all the way up to Damascus in Syria. In fact, surprisingly, I mean, how many of you all have ever heard of the Nabataeans before? Okay, four of you. Five, maybe. Um, the Nabataeans at their peak, which was between 100 BC and 100 AD, in that 200 year period, the Nabataean kingdom was actually two. Um, more than two and a third million square kilometers. Now to give you an idea, the Roman Empire at its height was only five million square kilometers. Around 100 BC, the Nabataean Kingdom was one of the largest empires that had ever existed. The only, at that time, period of time, before the Romans really you know, reached their peak, the only kingdom on the planet that was bigger than the Nabataean Empire was the Han Dynasty Empire in China, and they were four million square kilometers. So the Nabataean Kingdom reached all the way from Damascus in Syria, all the way down to the end of the Arabian Peninsula and over into Egypt, so from the Red Sea all the way to the Persian Empire. It was an enormous piece of property, and they were very influential. Now they got that big by being consummate merchants. They started out by having uh, various land, and this is sort of a sketch of some of the trade routes that they pioneered. They would have camel caravans that they, at first, again, as I said, they were sort of robbing other caravans, but eventually they created their own trade routes, their own caravans. They were responsible for bringing spices and um, incense, frankincense and myrrh, things of that sort, 
from the south of the Arabian Peninsula. That's sort of how they got started, bringing it up, trading it. They ended up later on trading into Africa, into Asia. They actually later, after the camel caravans were still going on, they started doing sea trade. They had ships called Dows. They went as far as China. So they had regular trade with China and India, various far eastern uh, locations. There are stories, legends, that they made it to the Americas. Now again, this is a long time before Columbus, but that they made it to South America and even North America, and that they had trade routes that went even that far. They were very significant. Here's another diagram of some of the regular land routes that they had. Again, all the way down into the southern tip. This is the Arabian Peninsula right here. We're right, well, we're right there right now, I guess. Um, Aqaba is here, Petra is there. So we're gonna go down into the Red Sea and then travel back up the Gulf of Aqaba, which is part of the Red Sea, and then travel up to Petra. This, of course, is, is Israel as we know it today, uh, Lebanon, Syria, etc. So you get an idea sort of the location. At one time, the city of Petra, I mentioned that they, they were nomads. They didn't believe in settling down. Well, when the Edomites moved north to take over the land that the Israelites had departed from, the um, Nabataeans came in, and when they found the city of Petra, they said, well, this is too good to pass up. And so they, they settled there, and that became their capital. Later on, they were responsible for founding cities in Basra and other places. But Petra became their capital. And the reason they were attracted to it is not only because of the the beauty of it, and there were some things there before they, they were responsible for building most of what you're going to see, but also they saw that it was defensible, that with a very small force, uh, they could defend this against attackers, and they were successful in doing that all the way up until the first century AD when the Romans, and there weren't many people that held the Romans off for very long, until the Romans came in and took over. So they were very significant in when they settled there, they made this their capital, and you will notice that Petra here is sort of at the center of a lot of the trade routes into Egypt and Africa. From there over, they could go north, Basra is one of their cities, to Damascus, trade into, um, at, into Asia, Persia, India, elsewhere by land, and then of course up into Europe as Europe began to be settled into Greece. They did a lot of trade with Greece. And then because they were here, they were able to use the Red Sea and travel over to India and China and places over there. Okay. So they were a very significant culture. They continued to grow all the way through the time of Jesus into the first century uh, of AD. Now in 63 AD, one of, well, one of the things that happened in the, the first century BC and into the first century AD is in Israel, when the Israelites came back in, uh, after they were allowed to return by the Persians, they developed their own kingdom. The Hasmonean kingdom was the Jewish kingdom of that time. At first, the Nabataeans were allies with the Hasmoneans, and then they started feuding with them. And there were, you know, there were battles between the Jewish Hasmoneans. This is uh, Judas Maccabeus and his his family in Can. If you've heard of that, um, they started having battles between them and the Nabataeans. That was one of the things that caused the Hasmoneans to contact Rome and say, "Can you help us settle problems here?" And Rome said, "Well, now that you ask." And in 63. AD, the general, Roman general Pompey comes in, conquers Jerusalem, conquers the Israelites, and then continues south and ends up also conquering the Nabataeans. But the thing was, the Nabataeans were so successful and they were making so much money that Pompey was smart enough, General Pompey was smart enough to say, I'm not going to suppress these people, I'm going to let them keep doing what they're doing and simply tax them. Because the more money they make, the more money we can make. And so between 63 AD, when Pompey conquered the Nabataeans, until the end of the first century, so 50 years or so later, they continued to be pretty much independent, but under the vassalage. You know, they had to pay taxes to Rome. In 106 AD, the last of the kings took over the Nabataeans, and um, he saw the handwriting on the wall, and he did what, surprisingly, a number of different rulers in ancient times under the Romans did. And that was, he said, if you'll leave me alone, and not bother me, I will will my country to you when I die. The same thing happened with some of the city-states in Turkey. Um, and so after his death, the last king of the Nabataeans, he willed the property, the whole kingdom, to the Romans. They ended up taking over after his death. And they turned it into, if you see right here, I think I've got a, a circle, 
They called it the province of Arabia Petraea. In other words, Arabia Petra. That was a Roman province after the death of the last, last Nabataean king. Now, the people still lived there. They still ran the city of Petra. There was still trade going on, and they still remained quite dynamic during that time. And you'll notice that in addition to this uh, province of uh, Arabia Petra, they had Arabius Nabatae was the sort of desert wasteland. It was still identified as being part of what the Nabataean kingdom had constituted earlier on. And so they were very, very significant in that regard. Now, at its height, the city of Petra, the capital, had somewhere between 20,000 and 30,000 inhabitants. It was a significant city. 30,000 was a large city in that day. And so, as you'll see when we get to it, I mean, if you've seen pictures, you may think, well, it's a few monuments. The city of Petra covered 400 square miles in these ravines and mountains. And it's built up the mountainside, as you'll see when we get there. They continued to inhabit, the Nabataeans continued to inhabit Petra up until about the fourth century AD. And we don't know exactly why, but for some reason, around the fourth century, they very calmly packed up their stuff and left. Um, we know that they did it fairly calmly because there's no indication of a, a disaster. There had been in the 300s a major earthquake that had affected a number of cities in this region. but. They didn't leave any silver coins behind or any personal artifacts. They apparently had time to pack everything up and move. But in the 4th century AD, for reasons we still don't fully understand, they simply left. And this became, the city was taken over by local Bedouins. Um, in fact, today, there are various Arab families that live in what used to be Nabataean tombs. Where you're going to visit, if you stay around at night, you can see and hear the Arabic families coming back from taking care of their herds and living in the various tombs and things that are now uh, in, in Petra. Now, during its height, uh, its, its, uh, height the Nabataeans were quite literate. We don't have any literature passed down from them because they, of course, things back then were written on parchment and on uh, the papyrus, you know, the sort of Egyptian-created paper, and none of those things lasted. The only reason we have some of the old documents like the Dead Sea Scrolls was because they were sealed in clay and buried in the sand and kept dry so that they didn't decompose. That's why we have some ancient documents. But for the most part, the things that were written back then did not, do not continue till today, and so we don't have hardly any of the portable writing, but we do have Nabataean inscriptions that are carved in stone. The Nabataeans were very wealthy, and one of the things that they did to show their wealth was they were very fond of giving money to the various temples. I'm going to talk about the religion in just a second. And they loved to be able to, to have engraved on stone in the temples that wealthy members of their community gave a large amount of silver, or a large amount of gold, or a flock of whatever to the local temple. And so we do know what their alphabet was like. In fact, um, this centerpiece here is the Nabataean alphabet. This is Aramaic, this is Arabic. It's believed that whereas Aramaic, the ancient language, that uh, version of the ancient language of the Babylonians, was one of the early Semitic languages, like Hebrew, in this part of the world, that Nabataean was developed out of Aramaic, and then Arabic was actually a development from Nabataean. So the Nabataean language and alphabet was a transitional language in between ancient Ara um, Aramaic and Arabic. And so we have a lot of inscriptions. We have places where people have simply signed their names. And so we, we have name after name after name engraved in stone. And you'll probably see some of that when you're there. Okay? So they were very literate people in that regard. It's a shame that we don't have any of the documentation that they would have left behind. But we do know what their, their alphabet looked like. Let's change pages here. Now, with regard to their religion, the original Nabataean faith was one in which they had their own pantheon of gods. You will notice this block of stone that has a face on it. Some of the ancient religions of that time would represent their gods simply by blocks of stone. Sometimes they would put faces on those stones, but quite often they're just blocks of stones. And you will see um, throughout the Middle East, the various cultures, Nabataean being one of them, that would represent their gods simply by these standing stones. You'll see in Petra, you will see these niches. In fact, when you first go, start into the Sikh, I'll tell you what that is in a minute, the entrance into the city of Petra, 
On one side, there are several of these blocks. They are called betels or sometimes gin blocks. They were representations of the gods of the local people. Now, the, the pantheon of the, the Nabataeans included the god Dushara, which was, it's Dushara literally translated as the lord of the mountains. He was their sun god. There also is Alquam, who was their moon god. Aluza was their star goddess. And Alat, their fertility goddess. You'll notice the first three I mentioned there, sun, moon, stars, they are the sky gods. The last one, Alat, was the fertility goddess. You remember from my talk the other day, sky gods and fertility gods were the most popular kinds of gods back then. Later on, their religion got Hellenized, meaning that the Greek influence came in. And when that happened, they began to represent their gods. This is an image of Dushara. Instead of it being just a block of stone, or a block of stone with a face on it, they started representing them in more human shapes, similar to what the Greeks had done, the Greeks and Romans. In fact, they ended up doing what the Romans did, and that is they took the, they, they uh, had a process of synchronization where they took the Egyptian gods and lined them up and made them equal to their gods. The god Dushara was equal to Zeus, Alquam was equal to Mars, Alat was equal to Athena, etc. And so they started representing them in a form very similar to what the Greek gods looked like. They humanized their depictions. But you will see some of these kinds of blocks when you get into Petra. And I do hope you're all going to make a point of making it to Petra. Um, I love this boat. It's wonderful to be on the boat. But some of these things you just can't miss. Um, Maximus of Tyre in the second century AD said this, he said, the Arabs serve I know not whom, but I saw this statue which was simply a square stone. So it was recognized very early on that they represented their gods by blocks of stone. Uh, they also had a number of other arts, as you can imagine uh, from seeing the stone buildings they carved. They were great on carving stones. Uh, creating figurines, various kinds of reliefs that they would put on their tome, uh, tombs and other buildings. They created coinage, which is another way we know a little bit about them, and they, they developed jewelry. Now, they weren't as productive in some of these things as other cultures of the time may have been, although they were artistic, primarily because they were more concerned about getting the stuff that other countries produced and trading it for profit to make themselves wealthy. But they were artistic. We do have examples, and you'll see some of that in Petra, of their art. But one of the things that was most particular about the Nabataeans, and the thing that made them such successful traders, was their ability to find and manage water. I showed you those trade routes across the desert, across the, the desert of Arabia, the Syrian desert, the Sinai. They had trade routes crossing areas that nobody else could get across because of how dry they were. The Nabataeans were miraculous engineers when it came to hydrology, to water engineering. Their greatest skill, perhaps, was their ability to find ways to capture rainfall, to direct it from either from, from rain or from springs. One of the things you'll see when you enter into Petra is there is, it's sort of, it's disused now, and so places it's full of dirt and things of that sort, but there's a water channel that they would have directed water from the Wadi, Wadi Musa. Wadi means valley or riverbed. The Wadi Musa, they directed water into the city of Petra. In other places, and so you'll see things that look like this where they would direct water, they would actually plant crops in the desert because they would identify um, that they would create a basin over a period of um, perhaps five times the area of what they were actually planting that would gather the rain when it did come directed into the location where they were planting fruit trees or crops of various kinds, and they, they were experts in soil management. They created a kind of less, as it's called, which is a soil that would absorb the water and then seal up so that it kept the water from evaporating once it was there. Um, all the way across the desert, we find, uh, they, they continue to find various other places that the Nabataeans had gathered water. They created these perfectly square, or perfectly cubical, I guess, um, reservoirs or cisterns. They invented a kind of waterproof cement. So they would create these square cisterns like these. They would seal them with this waterproof cement. And then they had the technology to direct the water into these locations so that it could be held for when they needed it. Throughout the desert, they are still finding locations where, this is an example of in Petra, 
where underneath one of the uh, buildings, there are cisterns where water would have been held. Um, in the desert, they are finding various reservoirs. The top one here apparently was a swimming pool because there are steps that lead down into it that appears as though they were using it for swimming. And you can see where this is, all right? It is in the middle of the desert. They still find these things um, they, because they were hidden. The Nabataeans <coughs> would not tell anyone else where their water sources were, which meant they were the only ones that could control the trade routes. We have an example, Herodotus, the ancient Greek uh, historian, and actually the one who's believed to be the first historian in terms of how we understand history, uh, who lived in the, in the 5th century BC, he wrote about the Persian army of Cambius traveling across the desert, and they were dying from lack of water. Well, the Nabataeans kept showing up with camels loaded down with skins full of water, and they sold it to them at an exorbitant price. <laughs> well, they'd let them go for a couple of days, and they'd be dying from water again, and the, the Nabataeans would show up with another caravan full of water, and they would say, where are you getting this? And the Nabataeans wouldn't tell them. This is one of the reasons the Romans were so fascinated and so much interested in, in taking over the Nabataeans, is to find out how it was that they were able to transfer goods across these deserts that nobody else could cross, and it had everything to do with their ability to find, to gather, and then to control water. And so you'll see some of these kinds of cisterns as we go in reservoirs as we go through Petra. Now, where is Petra? This is the city of Petra, and I'm very sorry for you all that I'm in your way here. I keep backing up, which means I'm out of Carolyn's camera view, but uh, she can still hear me. Uh, this is the end of the Gulf of Aqaba. This is the town of Aqaba, and the, the Israeli town of Elat is right here. This, this triangle here is the Negev Desert. This is part of Israel. This outline is Jordan. So we are in Jordan. Petra is the number one tourist attraction in the country of Jordan now, as you might well expect. This is Petra. It's about 50 miles south of the south end of the Dead Sea. Now, interestingly enough, you'll notice this is the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River, and then you have the Dead Sea, and then you have what's called the Wadi Araba, which is a major lowland wadi that runs down here to the Gulf of Aqaba. From there, the Gulf of Aqaba runs into the Red Sea, and the Red Sea runs down into the Gulf of Aden. But all of this is a major geographical fault which is called the Great Rift. Have any of you all been to Kenya or in East Africa? In Kenya, you can see the results of the Great Rift Valley because there's a huge plateau drop-off. That Great Rift starts all the way up north, and it's the Great Rift that causes this lowland depression that the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea, the Wadi Araba, Gulf of Aqaba, and the, the Red Sea. So this is all lowland area that runs as part of the Great Rift. Um, the Wadi Araba is very close to where Petra is located here. Um, as I mentioned to you, the city of Petra was about 400 square miles. It is a large area. They are still doing excavations. They are still finding things. Uh, one of the most significant archaeological sites where 20 to 30,000 people live. This is kind of a, um, well, there's Petra. This is kind of a visitor's map, which gives you a little bit of the lay of the land. Here is the visitor center and the entry to the city of Petra. You will notice these gen blocks on the right here, right across from the obelisk tomb as you enter the Sikh. Um, make sure you look for those as you enter into uh, the Sikh. The Sikh, or al Sikh, is this narrow um, canyon, which is about a kilometer long, I'll show you some pictures in just a minute, that is a, the result of water runoff and erosion over centuries. It is the reason why this city was protected because at places it's, it's 20 feet wide, in places it's barely wide enough for two or three people to, to walk through. Um, and it is very tall, in places it's almost connected at the top. Um, and I'm, you may have seen pictures of it before. From there, from al Sikh, you come out and the first thing you see, the first thing that Burkhart would have seen when he first visited this in 1812, is one of the most dramatic and most beautiful of the various uh, buildings there, which is called the Treasury, or Al-Khazne. From Al-Khazne, there then are roads that pass by the street of facades. There is a theater. Um, as you can see, there's a whole lot going on. And then Al-Deir, I'll show you pictures of the, the monastery is one of the furthest away. It's up on top of a mountaintop. 
But this is another sort of general map where you've got the, um, the visitor center, locations of toilets and cafes, very important. Um, the entrance to al Sikh, you travel through it, you see the treasury, the street of facades, the theater, the royal tombs, and if you wish, I'm not sure how much time we'll have, but all the way up to the top of the mountain, which is where the monastery is. Now, this is what the al Sikh looks like as you go through it. You can see the height, you can see the size. Um, I believe we're going to have horses, is that right? Is that, can somebody tell me that will take us in? Okay, we will. So this is the way in, and you can see why the nomadic Nabataeans felt like, okay, if we're ever going to settle down, this is the place to do it. The reason they were reluctant to settle down is because they felt like if we settle down, we're liable to be conquered. They saw this place and said, a dozen men can hold off an army of thousands if this is the way you get into this. So this is how we will enter through al Sikh when we get to Petra. When you get through Petra, this is the first thing you see when you come out of al Sikh, out of that, that canyon that takes you into it. This is called the treasury. Um, it is actually a tomb. The reason that it was called the treasury is because there was the belief for many, many years that there was a secret treasure that was buried here or hidden here. In fact, when you get there, you may notice that there are a lot of bullet holes up here because somehow they developed the idea that the treasure that was in the treasury, which again is not a treasury really, it's a tomb, that it was hidden somewhere up here in the upper sections. And so many, many people decided to shoot at it, hoping to break enough of the stone away that they could actually get the treasure to fall out. So you may be able to see some of the bullet marks when we get there. Um, this is particularly important. It is one of the best preserved. It's the first one you see when you get into, into Petra. It is one of the best preserved of all of the locations in Petra for the reason, uh, for the simple reason, you'll notice that it is inset back in the rocks. There is a lot of wind. There are rainstorms that come at certain times of the year. There is blowing sand. A lot of the various parts of Petra, like anywhere else in this part of the world, suffers from erosion, from sand and wind and sometimes water. This particular place is especially beautiful because they set it back into the, into the stone hillside so that it is protected from most of that. Um, I mentioned it is a large tomb. There are inside, now to give you an idea, this is um, 80, I think it's 82 feet wide and 128 feet tall. Um, if you can see, that, those are people right there. So that's how big this thing is. Inside, there are four rooms. There's an initial vestibule, and there's three rooms off of that. They believe that this may have been the tomb of one of the most popular and important kings of the Nabataeans, King Aratus IV, because he had two wives. And if this was his tomb, and it was appropriate because it, he died in 15 AD, which was right at the peak of their importance, he was responsible for them being as successful at that time. And so the idea is there's a vestibule and then three tomb rooms for him and his two wives, because he did have two wives at that time. The outside of the building is decorated in primarily Greek form. Um, the Greeks, the Hellenization we talked about, um, the, the Greek influence that started with Alexander and carried on, very much affected the architecture. I'll show you some images in a few minutes about of older buildings in Petra that clearly don't look like this. But here you have Corinthian, um, Corinthian columns, you have um, reliefs of Castor and Pollux, two of the Greek gods up above, you've got um, a, a sculpture of Isis, you have axe-wielding Amazons, griffins, eagles, winged victories, various kinds of vegetation and poppies, and rosettes. Rosettes were symbols of uh, kings, of royalty, which is one of the things that tells us this almost certainly was a royal tomb. Um, very dramatic. Again, this, is, this city's been called the Rose Red City. It's the, the color of the stone will vary through reds and pinks depending upon the time of day and the color of it, but it's a beautiful uh, red stone structure. Some of the other things that you will see, these are some of the tombs. Apparently, the, some of the older tombs were cut away when they put in a theater. There is an amphitheater there, again, the Greek influence, but the, the difference in the amphitheater is unlike most Greek amphitheaters, which are built from, they put stones in for seats and steps. This is all carved out of stone that's resident there, all right? It's all carved in place. None of these are stones that were moved there and stacked up. 
And so when they put in the theater, the amphitheater that held about 6,000 people, they ended up cutting through right through the middle of some of the tombs. And so you will see places like this where the tombs are opened up. They've been cut in half, basically, so that you can see into them. These are some of the locations where Arabic Bedouin families now live. Uh, they'll, they'll come back there at night after hurting and being traveling. You will see, this is along the street of facades. Um, you'll see the way, you can see some of the columns and things of this sort and buildings up in the hillsides. Um, this kind of, as you walk along through here, you will see various buildings. Now you'll notice the stone outcroppings up here. This kind of square form is very much more what the Nabataean structure would have been like before the Greek influence. Now, this is probably the second most famous structure. This is the monastery, Al Dair, it's called, or sometimes it's called the convent. Um, it is furthest up on the mountain. In fact, you can see a little bit in the distance. You can get a view. It's at 4,000 feet. You can get a view down into the valley to the Wadi Arabah and the, the city below. And so if, you, if we do get up that far, and I don't know if we'll have time for that, then you'll have an extraordinary view down into uh, the, some of the rest of the area of Petra and the surrounding territory. This actually, uh, it's called a monastery. Um, it probably was not a tomb. In fact, it probably was from its first building a, uh, a church, a temple. The Byzantine church, which was the Christian church of the East, came in here. This was, uh, this was used as a church for a while. Later on, it was, a, you know, it was transformed into a more modern church. Because while they started out worshiping Al-Dushara and some of their original gods, and then that was Hellenized to convert them to sort of a Greek understanding of the gods, later on Christianity came in and influenced them. And one of the reasons they believed, because Christianity had sort of a pacifying influence on them, that's one of the reasons why they sort of melted into some of the other cultures that were around them, and eventually the Nabataeans disappeared. They disappeared because they simply were absorbed into some of the other more dominant cultures that came along. Um, again, some of the extraordinary structures. You can see all of the column work and things like that. Now, here's an example of what probably would have been the er some of the earliest of the dwellings uh, and tombs because you'll notice they're square, they're block, similar to the fact that they represented their gods by having simple blocks or blocks with faces. Some of the earliest of the, uh, the building here were simply carved blocks. You'll notice on top, these pyramid blocks were often used as representations of their gods. This is one of the more formal kinds of god blocks, or betels, or gin blocks that they would have, would have prepared. Um, all the way along, everywhere you go here, you will see these various places, many of which were tombs. Uh, you'll see the openings down in here. So all through these ravines, all through these mountains, again, 400 square miles, there was structure, which was the city of Petra. This shit gives you a little bit of the scale. Again, this is the top of the center spire of the monastery, Al Dair, and here is a Bedouin man, and good on him for being up there. I'm not going to get up there, but you get an idea of the size of this thing. This is just the very top of um, one of the structures. Now, later on, when the Romans came in and took over, they were um, there was Roman influence as well. One of the things that we find, and that your uncle was responsible for helping locate, apparently, are some of the Roman mosaics that um, you'll notice here, eagles, and you'll, if you've ever been to any Roman sites and you've seen some of the floor mosaics, this is the kind of thing that were, was manifest from the Roman time. And this gentleman is cleaning it off, apparently, so you'll be able to see some of that as well. So this is the extraordinary city, one of the seven new wonders of the world, the city of Petra, the Rose Red City. And I'm looking forward to it, I hope you are. Any questions? Anything I can answer to you about that? Uh, my my knowledge of the Nabataeans, you pretty much heard all of it because we don't know a lot more. Yes? The chronology. Okay, the simple chronology. We believe that the earliest habitation of this location was about 1200 BC. That was the Edomites. Um, the Nabataean people, we believe, moved in there sometime around the 500s BC. That's when the Edomites moved north to take over the property that, the, that the, the, the people of Judah had left because they were conquered and taken into captivity by the Babylonians. So from about 500 BC until uh, about 400 AD was when we had the, the Nabataean culture here. Now, the, the primary time when they really were at their height, they were the largest and 
the wealthiest and the most active, was about 100 BC to 100 AD. In other words, for about two centuries, they really were at their peak. That's when they had conquered all the way north to, to Damascus and Syria, all the way over into the edges of Persia, uh, all of the Arabian Peninsula and everything else. So that's the primary thing. They, we believe they moved in there sometime around the 5th century BC. The culture, they evacuated Petra and the culture pretty much went away somewhere around the 4th century AD. So in that almost thousand year period was when they were most active. But the 200 years, right around you know, 100 AD, uh, BC to 100 AD is when they were most uh, at their peak. Does that help? Okay. Any other questions? Anything else I can do for you? Yes? Right. Baal was a Canaanite god, which would have been further north. Canaan was the area of Palestine that the Israelites conquered that became the Promised Land. So Baal and his consort Asherah were the two of the primary gods of the Canaanite peoples, but that was further north. Now again, there, there are similarities, because syncretism that I talked about with, between the Romans and the Greeks, it happened with the Nabataeans, it happened with others. But Baal worship, there's some great stories in the Old Testament about Elisha and the prophet of Baals and you know all of that kind of stuff. But there are a lot of other divinities there. Many of them you can sort of line up and see a relationship between. Any other questions? Anything else I can do for you with regard to the Nabataeans or Petra? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. We are back here at 2 o'clock when we will uh, have a talk, Alone in the Desert, where we talk about the, the development of Christian monasticism, and particularly St. Catherine's Monastery as we prepare to visit there in a few days. So thank you all very much.